Okay, uh, so hello everyone. Welcome to this edition of ICK's String Seminar. So today we have the pleasure of having uh, Amir Hossein Tazdini from University of California, Santa Barbara. And he's going to tell us about replica wormholes for an evaporating black hole. So you can start, Amir. Thanks, and thanks for the invitation. Um, it's great to be virtually in ICTS. So today I'm going to tell you about constructing replica wormholes for evaporating black hole. This is based on this paper that I wrote with Kanado Goto, who's a postdoc at Cornell, and my PhD advisor, Tom Hartman. So I should say that please don't hesitate to interrupt and stop me with questions. And let's get started. So in the context of black hole information paradox, the fine-grained entropy of Hawking radiation plays a key role. It quantifies how much information is lost. And as I'm sure that all of you have heard many times, thanks to the developments in the past two years, we now have a prescription how to compute this fine-grained entropy of radiation, which is this island formula, which gives us the the page curve, which gives us the, the fine grained entropy, which is consistent with quantum mechanics. So this is great. And it doesn't require any UV completion of quantum theory. It just, it just uses the low energy uh, data. And it's kind of intriguing that like, you know, there is such a, such a easy formula even exists for computing the fine grained entropy, given the fact that Computing fine grain entropy often requires hard computation for a quantum system, but somehow when you combine it with gravity, the effects of gravity can be written down in such a compact, easy formula. So as I'm sure you also know, this island formula is derived formally from replica wormholes. So these wormholes appear when we try to compute fine grain entropy using replica trick. So for integer n, we, ex we, accept, we expect to find like figures schematically like this, that the gravitational regions are connected through some wormholes. And I should say that although there's a lot of activities about like applying this island formula in different setups and different theories of gravity in different dimensions, um, replica wormholes themselves are not that well understood. We don't know even basic things about them. We don't know, for example, let's say for integer n, what's their Penrose diagram? I mean, are they even real? Or like, we, can we like even draw a Penrose diagram for them or not? Or we don't know whether they're traversable or not. So there are many questions about these replica wormholes that I think, you know, there are questions for future. But even near n equals one, which what we need to derive the uh, island formula, I still think the derivation is a little bit formal in these two sense. So first it requires Euclidean methods because the only way we know how to compute the you know, fine grain entropy when we have gravity is to start with a gravitational path integral. So that's, that's the first step. And then, of course, we can analytically continue in, in real time. But it just seems that this Euclidean methods might exclude like the canonical example of, uh, you know, black hole which forms from collapse and then it evaporates because it requires on this Euclidean methods. The other issue is it often the derivation relies on local analysis uh, near the basically the, the mouth of the wormhole. And there are some questions about like the global aspects of this like replica wormhole, whether they make sense or whether they're like, you know. Um, so yeah, so there are questions whether they globally exist or not, which, you know, these, both of these questions or these problems might not be important issues. Probably this formula is, you know, it's valid because it reproduces many things. But it's kind of good to have some hands-on examples and, you know, to be able to analyze these questions. 
It might be important in other contexts like cosmology or you know, different boundary conditions that people started to talk about. Uh, I should also say that there was this paper uh, a month ago by Zhidong and Dom Marouf and Colin Larin and um, Rangamani and Zhen Cheng Wang that they basically also tried to like set up the problem in the real time. So at least, you know, you can pretend you start with Euclidean, but ultimately you set up, you try to set up the problem of constructing replica wormhole in real time. So if you're interested, you can also see that. So my basic, my basic goal in this talk is to derive this uh, island formula for a black hole, which is which forms from collapse and then it evaporates. So for the typical black hole or canonical black hole that we want in um, you know, information paradox. So that's, that's the goal of my talk. And before even, you know, jumping into how to construct the replica geometry, we should first talk about the background that we're gonna, you know, construct our black hole. So that corresponds to n equals one in, in the replica trick, if you want. And uh, a set of models that they were very useful is these models where you couple uh, gravity system to a non-gravitational external bath. And in both systems, you have some matter, some conformal matter with transparent boundary conditions. Uh, so that's, that's the model that I'm also going to use. So for example, you have, so this is basically the content. So you have uh, the graph for the gravity part. I'm going to choose the JT gravity, so it gives us some ADS2 geometry. And on the bath, we have a flat, and in both sides, we have this CFD, and then we have to kind of glue them. So we're going to construct the Euclidean geometry, and once we construct those, we can analytically continue and get the Lorentzian geometry. So this, this will be the model I'm going to use for the background. And Sorry, Amir, can I ask you a question here? Yes. Uh, more because I am not following all the literature, which is growing fast. What's the story in asymptotically flat space? Not this JT coupled to a sector with no gravity, but just asymptotically flat space. Uh, you could do an S-wave reduction, or there are models from the past, uh, RST, etc. Are there replica wormholes known in those situations? You can answer later. I don't want to. No, 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 no. That's a that's a good question. So I would say, um, I mean, the 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 island formula has been applied in mm -hmm. that situation, and it reproduces the page curve. But the construction of replica wormhole is very implicit, mm -hmm. and it's not it's not as clear as this case that you glue ADS two to flat space, yeah. because you have to like impose, you have to fix some boundary condition and asymptotic, you know, at null infinity. Right. And then it's, it's less, yeah, it's less clear for me, like whether you actually have, like what's like, to what extent you constructed the replica geometry and like all of the details. I mean, if you look at the paper by Strominger and Hartman and Shavulian, Right. I think they have a they have a construction for it, but as I say, it's very implicit. So like they 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 start by some like Euclidean path integral, but they never really construct like a, a replica geometry. I see. I see. So sorry, but can I say Sandeep? Since you ask, I mean, yeah. I think there's a fair amount of evidence that page curve is not the right expectation in asymptotically flat space. Right? It is perhaps yeah. the right expectation for this model, which is a precise model. Yeah. I mean, you know, if in asymptotically flat space, you don't have factorization and then maybe there's something which is answered by the page curve, but yeah. you have to be careful about how you define this entropy of the segment R. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's true. So Rath, you're yeah, really- so we, Yeah, we've had this discussion. About that. No, no, and also you have the nice paper with, by, with Andreas Karch and so on. But I, I was wondering whether the very attempt of trying to construct the replica wormhole might in asymptotically flat space might lead us to the kind of uh, slightly approximate or coarse-grained entropy, you know, that we've talked about might exist, but okay. 
uh, thanks thanks a lot I, I will... maybe we can yeah i would be interested to see yeah, if we can talk about that maybe again later i think it's a very interesting direction yeah okay yeah thank you thank you thank you go go ahead yeah sure okay. so even about just the background um this there's, there's some sort of puzzle uh for us that i'm going to explain so i mean we are not the first people who wanted to construct the the replica of geometry or you know i analyze this problem of a black hole formed by collapse the first one of the first two papers who started the whole development was this paper that i call it amm uh, of mary engerhard Merrill from maxfield and they have a setup to construct basically this evaporating black holes uh, which is some sort of quench uh protocol so you start with some so this this is the this is the Euclidean time. So they started from some Euclidean ADS2, which was completely disconnected from the external bath. And then in some time, these two systems they become in contact with each other in Euclidean times, and then they evolve the system in Lorentzian. And they they modeled this this like contact between flat space and Euclidean and ADS2 by some shock waves. So when you, when you consider this setup and you go to Lorentzian uh, time, the effect of the contact uh, of these two systems will produce some shock waves. And you know, if you have a zero, black hole in zero temperature, once this shock will fall in, then it increases the temperature and then the black hole starts to evaporate. So that was the, that was the original model in this paper AEMM. And the puzzle for us was the following, that their, the equations they constructed in that paper, they were local in, in time. So in Lorentzian signature, so they have some Hawking radiation, which was local in terms of this X of T. And you know, once you can add the equations for the gravity, everything is local. However, in, in the model we considered in the you know, November of 2019 in the East Coast paper, we found that often this gluing of some ADS2 region to flat space region involves this notoriously difficult problem of conformal welding that I will explain more. And this problem is very hard. It's in general non-local. And it was this puzzle for us that even at the level of backgrounds, not talking about like, you know, replica trick, how these two are consistent? Like they had a local equations, but in general, in Euclidean space, this problem is highly non-local unless you are like, you know, near n equals one or something. Maybe in some situation it will be easier, but in general, it's a very hard problem. So we wanted to kind of find match between like our model and what they constructed, which as I said, it's just a puzzle about the background. So that's that's another question that I will try to address. That like how this conformal welding problem, which is a hard problem, can lead to like a nice local equations when we NLP continue in Lorentzian signatures. But I will explain about this conformal welding problem. Yeah, in a few slides. Um, okay, so uh, the outline of my talk is basically hey. to. Sorry, was there a yes, question? Yes, I have a question before you go on to the outline. Mm -hmm. uh, in this, uh, yes. it, it's something that's puzzled me and maybe I should know the answer. In, in higher dimensions, when you do this, you take ADS and couple it to a flat geometry. One of the things that happens is because, you know, the stress tense on the boundary of ADS is not conserved, the graviton in the bulk picks up a mass. Uh, uh, so, you know, uh, just because there's nothing to prevent it from getting an anomalous dimension. What happens in GT gravity? I mean, there must be some analog of that effect in GT gravity. Uh, do you know what that is? Um, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that question, but I would say that at least for our model, we will consider a large N matter uh, in both sides. So in that limit, we can just omit any contribution from gravitons. So we won't like bother with the country with like 
you know. Yeah, yeah that's like, true. Who wants to quantize gravitons? We don't, like, yeah, we don't. But, but um, can, I, can I suggest an answer, if you don't mind? Because we did quantize yeah. the theory uh, gravity as well. Uh, Suvrat, I think all that happens is that the mass is not conserved anymore on the JT side, as Amir knows very well, yeah. um, because it leaks out. And since there are no gravitons uh, to begin with in 2D, you don't have another effect analogous to higher dimensions. Just the consequence of the dilaton, et cetera, equations now is that you don't have a conserved mass. And uh, you, know, you can work out the uh, effects of the quantum, uh, quantum gravity effects also, but at root, that's, that's what happens. I see, because this graviton picking up a mass is some kind of a one loop effect. It's the fact that the stress tensor in the boundary theory picks up an anomalous dimension. You're saying that just doesn't happen if you have quantum mechanics in the boundary. I mean, as far as I know, the stress tensor is not conserved and that's all that there is, you know? Uh, th that is to say, uh, the, the mass, which is the only uh, component of the stress tensor in this 1D boundary, right. Right. That's, that's not conserved. Right. I see. Okay. That's, uh, as far as I can tell. Okay, okay. anyway. We, Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So I, I will first tell you in a little bit more details the background that we're going to work on in Lorentzian signature. I will start with Lorentzian signature. This is basically the AEMM setup. Uh, and then I will tell you how to obtain that background in starting from a Euclidean signature and like deal with this conformal welding problem. And then finally, that we understood the background, we will go to the um, construct the replica geometry for this evaporating black hole. So that's, that's the outline. So let's start with the, um, yeah, so with the Lorentzian background. So our setup is very similar to the, this previous setups. So let's, uh, just to remind everyone, let's start with the eternal black hole coupled to external bath. Our theory content is, again, JT plus some large end matter. Uh, as I alluded, we, we, we don't, yeah, we don't really uh, bother with the graviton contribution, like for, from the one loop boundary effects. Um, and as it's very well known in this JT gravity in Schwarzian limit, the dynamics, once you fix the topology is in this uh, boundary curve X of T, which is how you glue the boundary of ABS2 to this flat space region. And for example, for eternal black holes, there's no flux of energy. So the Schwarzian equation of motion it just tells us that x of t in appropriate coordinate is given by this exponential map. And this is the Lorentzian picture for the eternal black hole. Okay, so how do we create the evaporating black holes? It's the same idea as AEMM. So in, in, the, in the real time, let's insert these symmetric shock waves, which makes the problem Z2 symmetric. And here I'm starting from a finite temperature. So it's a little bit more general than uh, zero temperature black holes. I should say that the similar models also consider in these papers that they analyze the island formula and the background for finite temperature. So we also started from that. And here I wrote a few equations for like the dynamics. So the mass in this, uh, Schwarzian theory is proportional to the Schwarzian derivative of the boundary curve with time. And the flux of the energy has different pieces. It has a shock wave contribution. So there's this piece for T by Y plus Y plus. So this is Y plus. And there's this shock phase which comes in and there's a, because we are in a uh, finite temperature, there's this, uh, blocks from the background. And then once it entered this shock wave enters into the black hole, the black hole starts to evaporate and the, the Hawking radiation can be computed by this formula, which I will explain later, 
which basically is given by this short sin of X of T and T. And this is the Hawking radiation can compute. It was computed in this paper um, by basically like, you know, doing writing down the fields and do the normal ordering. And we will get back to this. I mean, one of the goal is to basically find this Hawking radiation from the Euclidean path integral to find like how how this Hawking radiation shows up. But for now, I'm just using the AEMM equation of motion and you can solve for the mass of the black hole. It's very similar. So it has some, when the shock is not, has not entered, the mass is the whatever mass the eternal black hole has in that temperature. And once the shock, shock wave enters, the mass will go up and then the black hole starts to decay and it will go back to the value given by the finite temperature and it moves, oops, moves the horizon a little bit. Okay, so this is, this is, the, this is the Lorentzian setup. You can think about it as a review of AMM. Is there any questions about this? Because now I'm gonna go to the, how to construct the same background using the Euclidean path integral. There was a chat. Um, Oh no, brackets are not commutators. Brackets are, um, so, so the, it's the Schwarzian derivative. So the definition is, so it involves, oops. So that's, that's the definition of the bracket. These are all functions of time. So it involves like triple derivatives of this boundary curve. Okay. So let's start with just the eternal black hole. So in eternal black hole, we can prepare the state at time t equals zero by this path integral which is basically for, uh, it, 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 it has two pieces. It has a gravitational region, which is Euclidean ADS2. Oh, there was a, let me see the question in chat. Oh. And then we glue it to this flat space region. So since we are working in finite temperature, it's on the cylinder with the periodicity, you know, uh, tau goes to tau plus two pi. And we can also use this exponential map to map everything to a plane. And for eternal black holes, um, since everything you know is symmetric, there's no the gluing is trivial. So there's no particular gluing. So whatever, so the x of x of t is basically given by x of tau is just given by this e to the i tau, which is once you analytically continue, it gives back the solution I wrote for the eternal black hole. So the gluing is trivial and we can just write down the metric and everything is good. So how do we create a background with shock waves? So there's a standard way of doing this in, you know, in the literature of 2D CFD where we insert some local operators in the Euclidean path integral with some offset. And once you evolve this, uh, you put, once you evolve this state in real time, this the the effect of insertion of these operators in Euclidean signature will create shock waves. So it will create like wave packets, which the width is given basically by this delta. And that's that's a standard way like to create shocks in the literature. And there's been a lot of you know papers about computing entropy in this situation. So this is called local quench. So we, we're gonna use the same setup. So here I wrote the properties of these shock waves. So the shock is created for, for our, our purposes, we're gonna create these shocks with the scalar operators and this, this shock will create energies of order this scaling dimension over this offset in the Euclidean dimension. So again, we have this manifold and we need to basically solve the 
X of T in this new situation that we inserted these operators. So that's, that's the strategy to create this Euclidean path integral. However, there's one issue and the issue is that we haven't really glued these two manifolds together. So because JT gravity is so simple, we know that the, for the gravitational region, you can just solve the equations and it's given by standard hyperbolic metric for the inside. For the outside, there's no gravity. So the metric is whatever uh, we imposed in the beginning, which is just a flat metric. So now we need to just glue these two manifolds together. And once we glue them together, then we can try to solve for the, the equation X of T, which basically mean, means we solve the geometry. And this gluing is this problem of conformal welding that I alluded in, in the beginning. So we mentioned this problem in the East Coast paper, and it's a problem that I think a lot of people, they may <laughs> skip when they saw the, our papers, um, because at least in that setup, it didn't really play any role. So it seemed more like a artifact of the, of the model. And still that's true, but as we will see, this is actually very important. Like this, this contribution from this conformal welding will finally give us the Hawking radiation. So if you just not, you know, if this problem wasn't there, the black hole even didn't evaporate. So it turned out it's important for this problem, but you know, still it's kind of a hard problem. So let me explain what, what the problem is. So the problem is we have, uh, as I said, we know that the metric uh, is hyperbolic inside and outside we know the metric, but in general, when we try to write down the Schwarzschild equation of motion, there is this non-trivial gluing between theta and tau, or between x and tau, uh, for the boundary of our ADS two versus the boundary of our flat space. And what we what we want to do is to let's say we have some free fermions or free bosons, and we want to just calculate their one-loop determinant in this background. So that will, and once we know that one loop determinant, that will give us the stress tensor and that stress tensor will tell us what the theta of tau or X of tau is. So that's, that's kind of the strategy. So the whole, like this, this problem is basically that I'm gonna explain in a second is just for calculating this one loop uh, determinant for the matter part. So what, what we want to do is to basically write down these two regions in terms of just one coordinate. So we have a coordinate outside V and V bar. We have coordinate inside W and W bar that we can write down the metric in these two coordinates. And gluing just means that, you know, then we want some coordinate where in that coordinate, everything is at least continuous, like metric is continuous, for example, and everything is glued. So. Another way of saying it is just, we wanna write down this W and W bar, which are the coordinates for inside the unit disk in terms of the coordinates outside, in terms of this V and V bar. So that, that's, that's what gluing means. And in fact, uh, given theta of tau, for an arbitrary theta of tau, it's easy to write down a coordinate extension from outside to inside, but it turns out that those coordinate extensions are non-holomorphic. So both W and W bar, they depend on both V and V bar. And for this type of coordinate extension, we don't know how to compute one loop determinant. So it's just a, yeah, that's, that's basically our problem. So we don't know how to compute the one loop determinant in that background. So instead, the strategy is to find a third coordinate to find a Z coordinate where in that coordinate, everything is glued smoothly. But the price we have to pay is to, we have to like, we have to basically map both of inside and outside to this Z plane. And in that third, where third coordinate, everything is smooth. So the problem of conformal welding is basically to find some uh, analytic map from inside, uh, call it G of W, and an analytic map from outside, F of V, such that, you know, 
they, they give you the same value at the, at the boundary. So that means they, they glue to each other. And the advantage is because these maps are analytic, now in this third coordinate Z, the metric can be written everywhere as a conformally flat metric. So that's, that's basically this problem of conformal welding is to find these maps F and G. And these maps, like they exist and they're unique up to some SL2, but in general for a given theta of tau, it's, it's a hard problem. It's as hard as like, you know, Riemann mapping problem. Like it's, it's kind of like that, that you know, can, um, there, there exist such maps, but it's hard to find them explicitly. But the good thing is if, you, if we can, like if you assume that these maps F and G exist and we write down the metric in this form everywhere on a plane, then we can just use the conformal anomaly for our, you know, conformal matter and compute the one loop determinant in this Z plane. And once we know the, the stress tensor in Z plane, we can basically go back by the field morphisms and find the stress tensor in the original plane. So that's that's basically this problem of conformal welding. Sorry, Amir, you already yeah. said this, but it wasn't clear when I read your paper with Juan, etc. So you say mathematically, it is known that such a conformal welding procedure can always be done. Your G and F can always be found. This is known, yeah? Yeah, yes. yes. Isn't that the Riemann mapping theorem? There's Sorry? the Riemann mapping theorem, right? That uh, they exist, that these maps exist. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, and, so they exist, but to construct is not easy. It's not easy. And I suppose they are unique up to SL2R, right? As you said. Yes, yes, exactly. Okay. Or, or maybe PSL2R, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, sure. Um, okay, so, so let's just assume that um, this, we find this map F and G, and then it's not hard to calculate the stress sensor in that case, because um, if we go back to the Z plane and we strip off this conformal factor. So if we work in the metric in Z plane, which is just a flat, flat metric, then we have two operators which are producing the shock waves and it's easy to find a stress sensor in that background. It's just basically given by this three point functions of psi psi t and once we know that a stress tensor, we can go back uh, using this short sand derivative, which comes from the conformal anomaly to find the stress tensor in the original plane V that ultimately will feed into the, you know, the, the, the short sand equation of motion. So that's, that's kind of the strategy to construct X of T. Um, so as I said, it's a hard problem, but perturbatively we can make progress about this. So let's say, for example, the energy of the shock. So we have the, this eternal black hole and then we just send very small amount of energy into the black hole. So in that case, we expect that the, you know, the, this theta of tau will be trivial. That's for eternal black hole. And then there will be some perturbation, this delta theta of tau. And the, the detail is not really important and it's pretty simple perturbatively when you try to solve this conformal welding. And we can just do that at least to first order. And it involves like some sort of projections into negative and positive frequency modes. This is just because this F has to be analytic outside and G has to be analytic inside. So in general, there will be some sort of projection. So given delta theta of tau, for example, delta F will be given by picking just the parts of this function, which is analytic outside. Delta G is given by parts of this function e to the i tau delta theta of tau, which is analytic inside in, in, the, in the unit disk. So this is just sort of things that you will get. Uh, but as I said, the detail is not very important. What's important is we can just solve the equations for mass of the black hole, for example. So in this limit that the energy of shock is a small, and at least in this limit, we will find that the solution has two pieces. It has a piece which 
involves this positive frequency modes in Euclidean and involves a piece which has only negative frequency modes. And the total solution is some of these two. So that's, that's what you find perturbatively. And what, you, what, what we found is that so, sorry, Amir, may I, mm -hmm. I'm sorry to interrupt, please. No, 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 that's, that's good, yeah. Here you're Thank doing you. it for small amplitude of the shock, but if I understand also, uh, in terms of replica number for N close to one, is that correct? Because- uh, this, this is just uh, N equals to one so far. Oh, so far N equals one, okay. Yeah, okay. So, so, so far I'm just trying to basically find um, just the background, the background which you have a black hole which evaporates. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. Uh, so, Amy, can I ask one more thing? Uh, here you're preparing yeah, sure. the internal black hole and there's a shock which is emerging from outside. Uh, what if I wanted to create a state where there was uh, some uh, excitation that was emerging from the past singularity and falling into the future? Uh, is it is it is that something that's reasonable to consider or? Um, sorry, you mean the, you mean like kind of null infinity of the bath? Uh, no, no, I, I'm thinking of something that's not coming from the bath at all, something that is not the eternal black hole to start with, something where there's some, you know, if you had not had the bath where there would be an excitation that would emerge from the past singularity ah. the boundary and fall into the future singularity. And so the, some excitation that doesn't originate from the bath, but that's autonomous to the gravitational system right yeah that's that's a very good question um i yeah the problem is um you know we i mean we can't try to insert these operators in the gravitational region but it's it's i don't know how to define that in a gauge invariant way um but it will be nice if there is a way um I see. Uh, yeah, the reason I ask this is because if you wanted to make uh, uh, discuss this whole procedure for generic states, I mean, this is a very special state in some sense, yeah. uh, then this would be very important, right? That there should be some way to... Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's okay. very important because, yeah, ultimately, we don't really want this bath and like, yeah. <laughs> so we want to like apply it to the other cases that we only have gravity. And, um, but so far, it's it's, I don't know how to... Yeah, Can't, define it using a path integral. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. So, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, no, in this, in this, uh, in the Stanford paper, uh, in this uh, paper from Stanford Unit, I mean, yeah. they, they had this notion of trying to insert, I mean, they had this notion of preparing like states which were not just the eternal state, right? But they, they had this end of the world brain and they tried to insert operators there. So uh, I'm actually happy. I mean, I, I, let's agree we have the bath. So the, ba the bath is fine. But even with the bath, I was thinking you could try and prepare like states in the, JT theory that were not the eternal black hole. As you said, I mean, I want some sense of yeah. being able to insert uh, operators, but you're right. I don't know how to do that in some precise way. But, uh, yeah, I think there's a paper by all the Subramanian and collaborators where they have a setup where they, they kind of start from a S2 and in their setup, they can define a state where you, oops, sorry, that where you insert the excitations on the north and south pole. And I believe they argue that this is, this is okay. Like this is like, um, this, is a, this is a good state, but maybe it's because it's, they, they, they inserted at zero at infinity, like once you mapped it to a plane and that's how they create their states. But um, yeah. So maybe 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 it can be done. I mean, even even in presence of conformal matter and all of that, we can just um, kind of maybe add the excitations at the boundary, as you said, like end of word brains, or maybe there is there might be a way to even like yeah insert it in other parts of the path integral. But that for us that that's that's kind of the reason why we started from the bath because that's like you know the standard. You have just CFD there, so we can just uh, construct the path integral. But it's, it's a good question. Yeah, you should go on. But just to say, you know, I think perhaps even in the JT case, when you prepare the state through Euclidean evolution, you know, the eternal black hole, it's like you start with a semicircle and fill it in to be half a circle. 
Mm -hmm. You can insert operators, I think, at the boundary of that semicircle, you know? Right, right, right. And exactly. I think you might be able to prepare other states of the type Surat might have in mind, you know? Exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, but anyway. Yeah, yeah, great. Very interesting question, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, uh, could, you, could you explain this delta F, delta G relations once more? Sorry, can how, you how, can you repeat how, that? How did delta F and delta G become positive and negative frequencies? Oh, yeah. So, so what what's like if you want to drive this, um, you basically have to like assume that F has just some expansions because it's uh, some analytic map for outside. So you can, for example, like in general, this F of V which V is the coordinate outside should be written as some like mode expansion where N is, you know, negative or maybe it's like non-positive. And you have the similar expansions for G, which because it's analytic in, inside, you also have some other mode expansion. Where ah, Okay, thank you, yeah, yeah. And then we have to just match them at the boundary. And once you do that perturbatively for given theta of delta theta of tau, you basically find this, this sort of projections. But just the fact that there is this positive negative frequency business, it's just because what, you know, the, in conformal welding, what's the domain of analyticity of these maps? So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so once, once we do this, for a small energy of the shock, we will find that we will find that the mass of the black hole is a combination of these two positive and negative frequencies. And at least in this limit, we can start changing the delta. So we can go to smaller and smaller deltas. And um, so this is, for example, the plot for when the delta over L, L is the distance, this distance is getting smaller. Um, you notice that the region that these two solutions, they overlap, it just gets smaller and smaller. So when Delta goes to like zero, there's no overlap region between this positive and negative frequency modes. And this is something that could only happen in Lorentzian signature because in Euclidean, since the theta of tau is, has to be real, if it has some positive component like e to the i tau, it should also have e to the minus i tau. But the observation is, that if we go to Lorentzian, like if you start with Euclidean and then go to Lorentzian, then you can have a solution which is purely negative modes, like they come from the negative Euclidean modes, which is this blue one. And in the early times, it's just purely positive modes. So yeah, oops, sorry, uh, what happened? Okay, good. Um, And what we found is that basically this no mixing condition, although we started from the small energy of the shock, but this condition will satisfy to higher orders in energy of the shock. So one can solve this welding problem for a non-perturbatively, like for a, any energy of the shock by basically, you know, the same philosophy that like, if you only have positive or negative frequency modes, this conformal welding is an easy problem. So it turned out that as, as this delta goes to zero limit, perturbatively, if you continue to construct the solutions of the welding problem, they have the same form. So they have this no mixing conditions. And in fact, you can just write down the solutions for this conformal welding. But in general, when we go to Lorentzian, this map, F and F bar, they won't be complex conjugate anymore. They will be the independent functions, but the, the message is that this welding problem can be solved in, in Lorentz, like once I, in this delta goes to zero limit that there's no overlap, it becomes an easy problem. And we can explicitly construct it in terms of whatever X of T is. So that's kind of the, one of our main observations. So, sorry, so, Amir, can you say again yeah. what was delta? I missed that. Sorry, is it yes, the, yes. 
This width of the pulse, was that what it was? Yes, yes, exactly. So the delta was this, like how far, what's the offset in Euclidean, which controls, you know, yeah, uh, the, the wave, width of wave packet. And as delta goes to zero, we found that there's no problem for this, like there's no mixing problem. So you can solve the this conformal welding problem in Lorentzian. So that was the that was the basic observation. But for that, like the way we derived it was that if we first looked at small energy and then take delta to zero, but we saw that like in that limit, you can now go to higher orders in energy and the pattern just persists. Uh, and we can still solve this conformal welding. And moreover, we found uh, we find that basically this Hawking radiation, the term that I wrote for you for a stress tensor, which allows the black hole to evaporate, actually comes from this contribution of the welding term, which will be like, as I showed it to you, once we know this map of F and G, we can go back and calculate the stress tensor in the original plane. And in fact, the that's, that's, that's how we will find the Hawking radiation. It just comes from this um, solution of the welding uh, problem. So that, that kind of addressed the puzzle about the background that I mentioned in the beginning that how these two are agreeing with each other, like we will find the same basically equations and the same mass versus time as AEMM uh, because, because this problem becomes easy in Lorentzian. I should say that it will be nice to solve this welding problem directly in Lorentzian signature, but Unfortunately, we weren't able to do that. Like we have to, at least we didn't know how to define the domain of analyticity directly in Lorentzian signature. So our strategy was like always a starting Euclidean that at least we know what the problem is and like what's the, uh, what should we find and then try to construct and go to Lorentzian signature. So that was our strategy, but um, probably it's nicer if we can just try to solve this directly in, in, in Lorentzian. I should also say that like, it, like the, the AEMM setup, like even without like all of this welding business, um, I mean, it's fine. Like they, they constructed a solution, like they found Hawking radiation and they constructed the geometry. So all of that, I think it's completely fine, but because ultimately we wanna go to replica trick, uh, for, you know, uh, for finding the, the entropy that we need to start from a Euclidean setup. Like if, if, if it wasn't because of going to replica trick and replica geometry, they, they have some Lorentzian state and that's the evolution of it. But because of that, we need to start with this like time reflection symmetric configuration in Euclidean and then go to uh, Lorentzian. So that's why we had to go through this like, you know, difficulty. Okay, so that concludes the, the, my discussion for the background. So now I can also tell you quickly about the replica geometry. Um, so, so before going to like details of the, the path integral, let me just mention some of the quick, you know, uh, remarks about calculating the island formula in this, in this setup. So you can consider different regions that you're trying to compute its entropy. For example, one can consider just a region which is completely on one of these uh, external paths, let's say in the right side. And then in general, we have a problem or a paradox whenever the quantum fields, the entropy of quantum fields on some region will exceed the generalized entropy on its complement region. Then you have a problem cannot um, purify. And without islands, the quantum fields in this region R in general has three, three contribution. There will be a Hawking contribution to the entropy. There will be a shock wave entanglement entropy because these shock waves is entangled with these shock waves. And there will be IR divergent piece, which won't be important. Uh, the dominant contribution will be this Hawking piece. 
um, as we go to late times. And one can just basically repeat the AMM for this situation when you have finite temperature. There's no magic. The, the rate of the Hawking, like the, the entropy of Hawking is just given thermally populated. Um, and the generalized entropy of the complement region of this region R is basically given by the black, it's almost given by the black hole entropy. So we can just do all of, you know, the island calculation and we find the location of island and we reproduce the page curve again. The only thing that, you know, it wasn't really known in this, I mean, it was known, but it's not very clear in some of the previous calculation, I think is that sometimes people just consider one-sided island, which is fine for zero temperature black holes, but for the two-sided case, the island has two endpoints. So it's, one should check, for example, whether these endpoints, we don't want these endpoints to go like to the left and know anything about the left. So it's, it's a consistency check that the other endpoints also, it, appears at the point that you expect. In this case, it will actually will be in the bifurcation point. But yeah, there's not much surprise about the island calculation for this model. I have we can also, question. yes. Sorry. Can I ask a question? Yeah, so this uh, center charge uh, that you have uh, the, in your calculation, does it have to be large? Um, yeah, we consider it to be large. So I, we don't where, did have you, to... where did you use that? So semi-classical method will work because of that. Yeah. yeah, we want just the stress tensor to be large, but not too large. So for example, we don't consider one loop effects coming from the gravity. So we consider gravity to be classical, but yes. we consider it large and matter to produce a significant stress tensor. But still, like C is still smaller than G Newton, like one over G Newton. Okay. It's, yeah, that's- Okay, I understand. So that's what I was asking. So it's smaller than one upon G Newton. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thanks. There was a question. What is S gen? Yeah, good. So. So in the in the in the original way of like before holography and all of that, S gen is often defined as like the entropies outside. So in like quasi like you know static approximation, uh, S gen is defined by like entropies outside the horizons of the matter field plus the areas at the horizons. So that's how you define S gen. So it's basically S of matter out plus the area at the horizon. And in the in with the understanding of island, it becomes basically the you have to define it by minimizing the contribution of area plus entanglement entropy of outside. Um, so once you minimize it, you will find it. So it's basically like the complement of island formula, if you want. Um, so that's that's how it defined these days, like uh, with with the uh, with the quantum extremal surfaces as gen generalized entropy. But in the quasi-static approximation, it was just defined as entropy of outside plus the area, and these two will be the same in this in this problem. So you can use either. Um, so it, it's supposed to con, con, to take into account the, the gravity effects and the quantum fields outside. Um, so that's Jen. But ultimately, for this calculation, we just use the island formula for um, which I wrote in the beginning to calculate S of R. Um, yeah. So. There are other also cases like for, we can consider the, the region R, which goes all the way to the left region. In that case, the island will have just only one endpoint because the island will be connected and it will only have one endpoint, but the calculation is very similar. And either way, 
if you take temperature goes to zero, we can basically get the one-sided black hole. So ultimately we only need like um, islands with one endpoint will be enough for the problem of zero temperature, but depending on what you try to cal calculate, the islands might have two endpoints. Okay, so finally also let me say a few things without going into too much details about how to how we constructed these replica geometries. So let's let's consider the case that uh, we only have single interval. So this will be basically similar to this case that the region R goes all the way to the left side and the island has only one end points. So here I just considered the complement region. So this is like region R you want and then this will be the island region and this is the endpoint of the island but because it's easier to draw the picture for the complement basically what we're trying to do is to consider this replica geometry and solving the replica geometry in this situation means basically to find this boundary curve wn of tau that's what solving it means um, but in general, we have to do two things to, in order to construct this replica geometry. We need to construct the, we, we need to set up the gravity equations. Um, so for the case that you only have one interval, actually what we are dealing with is not a higher genus surface, it's just a unit disk because you have this, you replicate this, but you can uniformize them and once you uniformize this manifold, you will basically find this a unit disk. So the topology for this single interval case is very trivial. So it's not really wormhole in that sense, but that's the easiest thing we can start with. Um, and once you know about the gravity equations, we can ask, okay, what's the stress tensor in this replicated geometry? So these are the two, two pieces and if you uniformize this, basically, I don't know, for n equals six, we expect to get some figure like this. So we have these operator insertions that they created the background. And now you're considering this uh, cut in order to replicate our geometry. So we have to, so that's, that's kind of the manifold that we need to solve the equations on. And as I said, I mean, so can, in, I, can I ask yeah. a, a yes. question? How do you know beforehand how many fixed points of the Z and symmetry are going to get? Uh, do you do it near N equals one and then just assume it's the same number as you go up in N? Uh, yeah, that's that's an excellent question. I mean, um, I mean, in general, we have this, in JT gravity, we have e to the minus S naught suppression. So um, if, if we wanna just add multiple points for the end, for the islands, then yeah, right, we expect right. that they will be suppressed. But, you know, in general, we kind of have to be more careful. I mean, for here, I, I'm not that careful. It's just like, okay, we have the ordinary, the, the the ordinary manifold where the region r is this and now if you have island we will pay back this e to the minus s naught uh but that's fine but you're right that in general we need sometimes to check that like so like if you won't yeah maybe there are other contribution but the matter entropy is big but here i mean based on the fact that you can check the island formula we don't expect any surprise so that's why i consider one interval but yeah um so anyway, so for this case, it's it's it the solving the geometry just means solving this boundary curve W n of tau, or if you go to the parent manifold, solving the W tilde of tau. That's because there's no modulus, but in 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 general, if you have two intervals and higher like twist points, we need to also find the the modulus of higher genus surface. So for the gravity part, the calculation is actually easy. Roughly speaking, we uniformize. So given this point A, we can just uniformize the geometry by you know, mapping it uh, to this manifold. 
And in, in, in the uniformized geometry, the metric is simple because it needs to solve the Einstein's equation. Metric has to be ADS2. So we can just write down the metric in the parent manifold. Everything is smooth in the parent manifold. And um, the equations, the, the, the gravity equations in the parent manifold is just given by the Schwarzian equations of motion. And the, there's a relation between Schwarzian derivative of parent coordinates versus the quotient coordinate, which I call it W and of tau. And you will find a relation like this and this R term, I didn't write it explicitly, but it has poles at this point A, and it's something that will be related to the dilaton. But the idea is at least the gravity part for this one single interval is easy because you can uniformize it to unit disk. There's not much, it's, it's not hard to like analyze it. And that's basically the same as previous, like the previous East Coast paper, the only difference is now we also have these shock waves, this, this uh, violet points around in the external path. So what's the other part is to calculate the stress sensor and that stress sensor at n equals one, it had this background piece that I told you and there will be some uh, corrections near n equals one. So there will be corrections due to this welding corrections that it, that will change because now we are near n equals one. And just if, if it wasn't because of welding, we have now, oops, we have two twist points and we have this psi insertion. So we need to calculate the strength sensor in presence of some four point function when we go to the quotient space. So this is basically the corrections of a stress sensor. But once you put everything in, at least we know what equations we are supposed to solve. And we haven't managed to fully solve these equations, basically because this perturbative welding contribution that I briefly mentioned, it's still non-local, even though that for the background we understood it, but near n equals one, still this contribution is non-local. So we don't deal with the differential equation that we can solve it numerically. Although there were some papers that they tried to to solve this welding problem numerically. We, try, we didn't try that hard. Instead, what we did was to, we integrated these equations of motion. So you will find an equation motions, something like this. So it has this quotient space like boundary curve WN of tau, and it has these other pieces and we can just integrate it. So we integrated against this SL2R kernels that the Schwarzian theory has this SL2 symmetry. So we integrated against some appropriate kernel. And once we integrated, we found basically the island prescription, which is just the derivatives of the S gen. So this is the definition of S gen. So we find the island formula. And we, this, this argument actually is general. And we found that it works for any background with any number of operator insertion. It's a complementary, like, um, derivation for the island formula to the local argument. So there's this local arguments that you just work near the, um, the dynamical twist points and try to solve the equations near that point. The difference here is that we just work at the boundary. So we integrated our equation of motion at the boundary. And again, we found the same thing. So it's kind of complementary, but there's not really much advantage. It's just one could maybe call it a little bit more global argument because at least, you know, you, you start with the boundary curve and not just work near the boundary point, but ultimately it's very similar. And just one more thing, because in this case of evaporating black holes, the, we expect to find the islands at the, in late times, there is no island really in Euclidean signature. So once we try to integrate this equation of motion to find the island formula, we need to follow a schwinger keldish contour. So instead of just working completely in Euclidean, we will be in Euclidean for a while, but at some point we will go in Lorentzian time and it will, we will come back. And using this schwinger keldish contour, we basically we verified this formula again. Um, and you can, once, once you have this equation, you can solve for island formula and you will find that it appears in the Lorentzian, you know, in the real time. 
So that was basically our derivation. Um, still, we were just working near n equals one. So we were just constructing this wormhole near n equals one. And even for that case, we weren't able to solve the equations everywhere, but at least we just integrated and verified the island formula. And yeah, so that's that's basically all I wanted to tell you. That's what, what we did. And yeah, I will be happy to take any more questions if there's any. So thank you, Amir, for the very nice talk. So now if you have any question, please go ahead. One slightly, if you don't mind, uh, technical question to it, which I didn't understand, mm -hmm. which was, you know, I didn't see why you needed your schwinger keldish contour because I, I thought I was following what you did. You looked at the welding problem now with your two insertions of the shock wave, et cetera. And basically from the M equals uh, zero, one and, and minus one modes, perhaps you got back your uh, extremal uh, equations, you know, DA plus yes. minus yes. SJ. So mm -hmm. I, I thought I was understanding, but where, where did your schwinger keldish contour come in? I, I didn't see why you needed that in what you were describing, Amir. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I didn't really explain it. Uh, so the, the point being that if you just try to solve these equations, I mean, if you, if you just want to stay completely in Euclidean, yeah. there, there's no solutions for these equations. Oh, like, I see. You will find it, but you, there's no solution. And um, actually the geometry, the X of tau, it's also non-trivial in, in, in Lorentzian. Like if you remember the, the, the mass that I, that I drew was something like, just the background was something like this. Right. So you, you really need to go to Lorentzian time to see some non-trivial profile for the geometry. And that's, that's basically why, like, if you want to, like, if you want to find the island, if you just use the schwinger keldish contour in Euclidean, like, you can just, you know, don't go to Lorentzian and then close the contour here, then you won't find any solutions because the, everything is trivial. Um, and and also another reason was that the sorry the, the the region R that we inserted was already in late times, so that's that's another reason we need to con I mean that was the reason I should have said that was the reason we need to schwinger keldish contour because you know you you could have inserted a region R which was completely Euclidean, and even in that case um, you know if the that, that case will be more like the eternal black hole because the shock has not even inserted, has not even gone into the black hole. So if, if the interval is at t equals zero, the calculation for finding the island will be exactly the same as the eternal black hole. But if, if you demand to have your regions at very late times, then you have to also like go on the schwinger keldish contour um, because, you know, like the region that you're inserted already is in real time. So that was the reason that we had I see. To so, so is it because this is part of your earlier paper with um, Maldasena and so on that I haven't yet worked through? Without the shockwave, if you consider the, the case where you have two regions, but at, at late time, you know, both sides going up, is right. it still, still true there that you have to look at a Schwinger Keldish like contour in that case? Because you're no longer at that uh, time symmetric case again, but you've gone up. Is, is it still true there that you need a Schwinger Keldish contour? Um, yeah, I, I think so. But I think in that case, um, the problem might have, I guess the problem has boost symmetry. So the calculation will ultimately be the same as like you bring the, bring the interval back in time. But you're, Okay, well maybe I can talk offline, but you're 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 moving it in a boost non-invariant way. You know, instead of using the boost, right? Because you're answered, you're moving the both sides in opposite ways vis-a-vis -vis the boost. That's why I. Oh yeah, yeah. When you move it both and the yeah, same both way, up. Yeah. Then you don't have it. Yeah. 
then you, then again you have to follow the Schringer Teldish function. I see. Okay, I didn't realize this. Okay, okay. I mean, it's 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 ultimately it's the same as like you start the equations in Euclidean and then when you solve them and you find the Lorentzian solution, that's basically the same as like following a schrodinger keldish okay. function. So you just continue them and that is in effect. Exactly. Okay, okay. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, it seems that there are no more questions. So thank you very much, Ramin, once more for accepting our invitation and giving a very nice talk. So I wish you yeah, a very nice. You. Yeah, so th thank you everyone for joining. Take care. Thank bye you. bye. Thank you very much. Bye, thank everyone. You. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you.